I, th I think that um, human competitions are, a, are a, a, a great tool. I can forge for two hours, but getting a pen in your hand and writing for two and a half hours is is a task. For me, a big thing is flagging up, change of posture, change of shoeing behaviour, and change of structure to the anatomy. We trim all the time, so I change of structure at the heels. I think some of those other signs that you might see on hind feet, particularly, would be toe dragging, um, because that indicates a, lock of, a loss of flexion through the limb. I've got different dressage clients that I shoe their horses with different sections. Welcome to the Lockdown Farriers podcast, the educational farrier podcast where we discuss the skills, knowledge and behaviour for the modern professional farrier. On a surface, it's exaggerated a lot more. They drop more through their medial aspect of the foot as it then drops down into the surface. With a concave shoe, you're actually biting into the surface more. So that was a 24, 48 hour temporary fixing, providing you follow the instructions. I would approach each horse like I was doing an exam. Episode 20. So it's that time of year again, getting ready for diploma exams in the United Kingdom. Um, unfortunately for these students, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they have spent the last 12 months not being able to come to college. Once the college is reopened again in March, you know, we've had these guys in most weeks, or we've certainly offered them the opportunity to come in most weeks and do uh, pre-diploma clinics at the Hereford School of Farry, and that's been working out really well. These guys are all fired up and they're back on track. The British Farriers and Blacksmiths Association, last year, they started um, coming out with this um, dip-tip programme where last last exams obviously colleges and examiners got on board and were doing little videos and um little bite-sized chunks of information to try and help these students you know with some of the tips you know what you got to remember we've all been there we've all done this exams we've all learned by our mistakes so rather than make mistakes you know use our knowledge to try and stop you from making those mistakes this time around uh the bfba <coughs> have posted all these uh dip tips again and some new ones off the examiners. And what we're doing tonight is we're just going to go through some of the practical diploma tips. And I'm lucky enough to be joined by Simon Moore, FWCF, who is a worshipful company of Farrier's examiner, both at diploma and the higher um, level exams as well, associate and fellowship. All, all we're aiming to do tonight is to go through some of these tips and just explain them a bit more in depth talk about some of the pitfalls because you know again the main ethos of this exam is we're battling against time time's always ticking sometimes you know we've got to play to our own strength and weaknesses some tips are going to help us some tips might even hinder us so we're just going to go through that just like to say a massive thank you to the british farriers and blacksmiths association for putting all these tips together and a massive thank you goes to um Claire Brown for all her hard work and effort into making this happen. Hope you enjoy it. Right, Simon, so obviously we're going to talk about um, obviously, with the upcoming diploma, um, the BFPA have obviously just been had their campaign with all the diploma tips. What we're going to do tonight is we're just going to go through some of the diploma tips that they've published on the practical side of, of the diploma exam. Um, obviously, I'm my experience. You know, I've seen lots and lots of diploma exams as a college tutor and spend four years really sort of like bringing them up to that point. Obviously, your experiences are based around being an AT, a successful ATF yourself and now um, an examiner too. So can you just 
talk about your experiences as an ATF, like how many apprentices you've trained and, you know, and maybe talk a bit about your experience as an examiner. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, as, as you just said, I think there's two ways to look at this tonight. Um, I'll give you my experiences as an ATF and how I used to prepare my apprentices um, for the diploma exam. Um, and subsequently, some have gone on and done their associate exams. So it's the same process, but just two different type of exams. Mm. And also as an examiner, just generally what we're looking at, just try and get rid of some of the myths that might be out there um, and that type of thing. So, but one thing I will start before, you know, before we get into it too much is that candidates must understand that from an examination point of view, examiners examine to a syllabus. And that syllabus is on the Worshal Company website under examinations. And that is what we examine to. Not my personal opinion on foot balance or my personal opinion on shoe length, etc. It's done to a syllabus and every examiner examines to the same. So the first one I'm going to myth I'm going to get rid of really is that it does not matter who examines you. We all examine the same and you will get the same result regardless of who is examining you on that day. And I really need to make that clear. Don't look on Facebook or anything I do on Facebook or any of the other examiners or how they fit or whatever. That's nothing to do with the examination. It really is um, all about the syllabus that is on the website. And I urge everybody to read that before doing their exams. We should have read it already, but if you haven't, definitely read it. The, the, the funny thing about that comment or that statement is the fact that Week one, block one, when I first meet um, Farrier students, when they start their apprenticeship, I tell them everything you need to know for four years from today is on that website. And if you trawl for it and you learn that, you know, you, you, you're you going to be set up for it. And then first day of block eight, two weeks before the exams, I ask for a show of hands, who's actually been and looked at it? The results are always quite disappointing. So yeah, it's. It, I've done the same on. I've, I've done the same on ATF training days or diploma days. I say, let's see who's read the syllabus. Put your hands up, and even and I'm sorry to say this, but a majority of ATFs have not read the syllabus. And my first thing is, is that you're going to train somebody, or you are going to take an exam, and you don't know what the syllabus is or what you should be doing. Mm. You're going on here, say he said, she said, etc. And but, every examiner before the exam will read that syllabus to make sure we are up to date with it. And we are asking mm. questions. I know this is practical tonight, but if you're doing the all, you know, we'll only ask you stuff that is on the syllabus. Mm. I mean, I've had conversation. So, yeah. I've had conversation with ATFs who have got students with me in the past. And they've asked me questions about the diploma exam or queried something about the diploma exam. And it's quite clear they are still basing the diploma on the diploma they sat 25 years ago. And it's the syllabus, yeah. not only does the syllabus change, the way the exam is delivered. And again, mm. for, for, there are people that are not only training the apprentices, but sort of running clinics where. You know, yeah. I've, come, I've come across that actually, you know, you see stuff on social media, you think that shoe's not in the exam anymore, you know, or that style of shoe is not in the exam. But, you know, it's just, it's a thing, you know, it's, I think, you know, as any form of educator or trainer, you know, you just, that information's there. And it is, and it is constantly updated as well. I mean, someone brought, I, I posted a video earlier today, and it's a good job I'm actually talking about this because I need to write my wrongs. I posted a video today, which was a video I made a couple of years ago about pre-diploma tips and stuff. And it was about using templates where I sort of said that the templates have got to be out of the building before the exam commences. Well, I've just noticed that's recently been updated to say they've got to be out by 30 minutes into the exam when the feet get um, examined. So if you're using templates, you don't have to get those out of the building until 30 minutes into the exam now. So if obviously, and yeah. I think with that, if you've, if you've had a, low, a lot, and we will touch on the templates later anyway, but if you've 
got a lot of foot on that horse and you put your 13-inch shoe on, you think it's going to fit, so you cut it still, start the exam, you've got the opportunity now, once you trim that foot down, before you finally commit yourself, just to stick that template back on the foot and know for sure, which I think is a good move. Absolutely. I mean, let, let's deal with templates now whilst we're talking about it. Well, you're going to mess up with my... Is... You, Simon, you're going to mess up I'm with gonna... the um, slides. Because they're on the slides. <laughs> oh, we... I knew you was going right, to come in here and mess everything up. Some slides, right, okay. Um, give me a second. Let me just... Um, <laughs> it'd be worth just pointing out as well, and I know we discussed this the other day, that... Um, let me share that. But we, and we did we did mention this in, as far as you know. These are tips and to try and help people. But if you've got a system which works for yourself, you know, don't feel that you've got to kind of conform to any of these tips. You know, and especially and especially with this this round of dip tips. I know last time I know some examiners did some anonymously, and I know some of the colleges put some tips forward. But this time it has all been examiners. Just because an examiner's given you a tip doesn't mean you have to do it to pass your exam. Absolutely, and that is you know the the, the first thing is these are tips, these are guides, these are not rules. Okay, mm -hmm. there's some things that I would strongly advise and there's other things that i would say it's up to you at the end of the day if you are about to take your exam in the next month or so or even if you're going to be taking it in november you're six months away if you not have not got a process about going about doing your practical exam by now you should have mm. so what these tips are are to just maybe help you in certain areas um, you should not now be totally rewriting your process of shooting making for instance or shooting a horse at this stage just because you've got a few things on a screen you know use them wisely but don't think they are definitive and you have to do it that way to pass this exam because no. you definitely don't i mean and it'd be interesting as well because i mean obviously i've, I've having a, had a look through there. there are some of the tips which you know from my point of view you know get getting these students ready over a four-year period i would not necessarily disagree, but I would sometimes tell some of my students to avoid that because it will send them, you know, um, you know, because of how I teach and how I try and set them up, that it's either, you know, there's, there's certain tips where if you are really struggling, like with foot shapes or fitting and stuff like that, yes, it might help. But at the end of the day, it's, the, you know, the knock-on effect of that is it's going to cost you time, which you haven't got. So... But let's I say, let's just go through these tips. Then. Da, 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 da. Right. So first of all, we're, we're going to start off talking about the pre-shoeing assessment. So for those who don't know what we're on about, this is the bit right. First thing on practical day, once you've had your the examination brief, and we're going to touch on that right now. Um, but, you know, this is the part where you get given your shoeing plans and they do the trot up and the evaluation of the horses before the exam commences. So the first dip tip, um, again, all these dip tips were put out by the British Farriers and Blacksmith Association. You know, I, I know uh, Claire Brown especially worked very hard yet again this year and got them out there, you know, which is really, really good. Um, so pre-assuring assessment, first tip, Listen carefully to the senior examiner's brief. This is important. If you have any questions or require clarity on anything, then this is your chance. The senior examiner will always be happy to re-explain something or clarify anything which you don't understand. It's your exam. Absolutely. Um, the only thing I would add to that, yes, the senior examiner, but also the fairy examiner or the veterinary examiner. We are all there to... Give, give you any advice that we can. We can't tell you how to shoe it and we will always um, be careful what we say because it is your exam. But if you have any questions, how stupid you think it might be or whatever, ask it and we will answer it um, as best we can. You know, we always make a point of coming around when you're taking shoes off. Are you happy? Is there anything you want to talk about? Do you want to discuss it? Do so, please engage with us at that point. You will not be marked at that point. There is, you can discuss it. And if you 
discuss something completely wrong, it doesn't matter. You're not marked from your responses to us at that point. It's how you shoe that horse. Mm. And, and that, that's quite, quite clear. If, uh, hopefully I'm, that's clear to people to understand that. You, you're not going to get a wrong at that point. Just, just, a, uh, just on a quick point, and before we go any further, just talking about asking questions. And I think this is important to bring mm. up. And it's a little bit about exam etiquette. Now, most examiners have been around a bit and certainly the way social media and, you know, lectures and sharing competitions, you know, people kind of know these people, if that makes any sense. And yeah. we've, had, we've had a few, I, mean, I believe you might have been at one of the examiners where there was a candidate from the same area as one of the examiners and he just sort of like bimbled up and said, oh, excuse me. And said his name remember if this is an exam you know you might know that person but actually at the end of the day you are but a candidate number and if you're going to address them it's mr or even doctor or sir or 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 mom if it's yeah if it's Sarah. <laughs> you know don't call her sir yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually there's a respect and yeah. i think you know we've all done that we've all done these exams um and even when i took my fellowship and at that level you know um a lot of the examiners um over the years you've been to clinics etc but on the day of my exam i called my examiners mr beverage mr poynton yeah um the same as when i did my associate because at the end of the day i respect them they are there and we're not we're not after praise or anything like that it's just uh, you know is a the right thing to do so when people turn around and say mate and i've had mm. that before hey mate and i'm like uh, excuse me no that's not how you should address people there's, there's a there's a manners and an etiquette to it um and i think you're right that danny you really you really should show that respect mm. um because we've all done it and we all we all do do that well in, in ex exam day it's a bit it's it's a big day it was etiquette i mean i'm not being funny i don't really stand for it when students come up and call me mate or pal mm, mm. you know i'm old enough to be your dad <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah it's right so let's move on to the next one so still on the pre assurance ass uh, assessment number two do not be afraid to say what you see on the static and dynamic pre assurance assessment of yours this is your opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge and will demonstrate to the examiners that you're capable, uh, a capable horseshoer. If uh, it's there to point it out, it's not there. You can't, it's not, sorry, I'm getting, can't read now. Yeah. If it's there, <laughs> point it out. If it's there, you can't. Oh, if it's not there, you if can't. It's not there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, either way, you, you are demonstrating your knowledge and enhancing the examiner's professional opinion of your capabilities as a modern day farrier. And I think we've had this discussion before about exams mm. where it's almost like the students have been, or the candidates have been briefed by their tutors. Whatever you do, don't engage with the examiners. You know, you're yeah. going to open a rabbit hole. You know, a lot of the reason, and I think you put it once, it's a, that that segment of it. Not only are you trying to, um, you know, see what that they are capable horseshoes and stuff. They're not being examined at that point. And also, if anything, it's a bit of an icebreaker. Absolutely, and that's the one thing when I when we're doing the trot up, I always try to have a little bit of chit chat with the candidate just to try and relax them. But don't, call, to, but don't call them. But don't call them mate. The, but don't call them mate. No, exactly. But you are not examined at that point. You cannot fail your exam, whatever you say to me at that point. Okay. And let's make that clear. It is not marked. It is not examined. So have a conversation because there's two things. One, it will relax you. And the other thing is you'll get information out of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we're watching the horse go, you will ask something or you'll suggest something. You'll get an idea if we agree or don't agree with you on that. And it will help you perform, uh, get a, a, an image in your head of, and a plan to fill in your shoeing plan. You've got a shoeing plan there that you're going to fill in. And that's what that whole 
point is at that point is that you can then get an informed decision on how you are going to shoe that horse. And we're going to come on, I know, a bit later on about how you shoot a horse for confirmation, etc. But use the trot up to your advantage um, to get as much knowledge as you can from the examiner um, to, to help shoe that horse. Now, wait, well, the other good thing to point out at this stage as well is that conversation you have with the examiner at the trot up, and even if you point out that, you know, it's landing really high on the outside, you know, I need to dress... You know, you're not actually committing yourself. That's not your shoeing plan at that point. You're not committing yourself to, well, I said I was going to do it. I better chop it down now and it's going to bleed. You know, it's, yeah. you're not committing yourself. It's just a conversation. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So make sure you engage with us because we actually want that. Uh, moving on to number three. Remember that the shoeing plan is there to help you. Obviously, for those who don't know, there is a shoeing plan you have to fill out on the day. It's only a single sheet of A4, and a lot of it's about circling boxes. Okay, Although there are no right or wrong choices on there, some choices will be better for the horse than others. Often, quite often, the best choices are the ones which have more pros than cons. You know, and again, you know, that shoeing plan, it, it's about, you know, what how are you going to clip it? You know, um, you know, what is that? And the other thing is you, you write down on there what the task is, which, you know, yeah, it, it's confirmation that you're actually doing what you've been asked to do. But again, it's, it's what section you're going to put on it and, um, you know, where you're going to clip it. Are you going to put a roll toe on it? That kind of stuff. It's it's very straightforward, really. Yeah. And remember when you first fill it in, you, you might have, an idea of how, what you're going to do you can change that as long as at the end of it when you come out for the trot up um, post exam you we will collect the shoeing plans off you and we'll look at the shoeing plan and say right what was you going to do and we look at it and we read it and then we see if you've achieved that mm. so just make sure the shoeing plan matches up to what you wanted to do now don't get me wrong if you've put on there that you was going to put quarter clips on it and you've suddenly decided to put a roll toe on it and it's not detrimental in any way and you've done it well etc you're not going to fail your exam just because you filled in a piece of paper to say it that way mm. okay but yeah. try and match the two together because it just gives you a proper plan on how you're going to achieve the different things now placement um, clips what you're going to do it gives you a written document as such in front of you of what you're doing mm. Exactly. And it, it's not marked. The shoeing plan is also not marked. Let's get that one out there, the same as the trotter. No, exactly. Um, number four, when you're looking at the horse on the pre shoe assessment, try and think of a similar type of horse that you shoe at work. Think of a horse, foot quality, size section of steel that you would use on that horse, and this should give you, this should help you in your decision making for the practical job. If it looks right on the horse at work, chances are that it will look right on the horse in the exam. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I normally say when we do the briefing, um, whether it's a senior exam or fair exam, we all say something. Um, I normally say to people, uh, to candidates, Shoe the horse like you would shoe it at home. Mm. That's what we want to see. We're not looking for anything flash. Do not be trying new things that you've never done before on exam day. That's definitely not a good idea. Um, but you shoe horses at home all the time. You know, one of the things people say is, what size, you know, what length should I shoe? What would you do at home? When you're at home, you trim the feet. You go and get a shoe out of the van. I know it's pre-made most of the time, but if you do, you're going to select a shoe for that horse. And it's exactly what you're doing when you're, you're doing your pre-shoeing assessment. The same as the section, the width. Think of the tasks that you've been set, um, but the width of the shoe and the section needs to be relevant to that horse. Mm. Yeah, I, I just think it, it's quite funny as well sometimes when i've been at exams and the horses turn up it's almost like sometimes the candidates have been daydreaming for four years about the final last day when they do their exam and they, it's almost like they've envisioned this beautiful textbook foot 
Well, mm. they're quite few and far between. Now, the one thing we do at the Hereford School of Farry is we always try and ensure that the best horse's feet on our books are there for exam day. You know, uh, uh, you know, we do that for the hires as well because we've all done exams and competitions before when you get a not very nice foot. So, you know, we always try and give them something to shoe, you know, something good and solid um, to make their life easier. But, you know, if it has got a slight crack in it or a little bit of foot missing or it's got a lot of foot on it or even not a lot of foot on it, you know, you probably shoe horses with worse feet every day get over it you know you yeah. just you're yeah. just trying to scare yourself and create a problem before it even starts the ultimate thing with examining is that you are trying to make a, a decision based on two hours of them shoeing a live horse or whether they are competent and safe to go out and shoe horses on a daily basis unsupervised under license yeah you get your license and you go out you pay your fee um and you're registered with the farrier's registration council so our job is to make sure that under an animal welfare act you are safe and that is the key with the diploma exam are you performing safe good quality shoeing for that equine yeah you know, and, it, and it, again, it's the same as your driving test. Your driving test is a basic driving test. It's not an advanced driving test, you know. Um, and it's just to see if you're safe out on the roads. Uh, number yeah. five, remember the choice you make on your shoeing plan form are flexible. They are not set on stone. If you decide to amend them, then this must be done within the foot preparation phase of the exam which is within the first 30 minutes of the start. If you decide to amend any of your choices, you must tell one of the examiners. Again, like we, we touched that earlier, you've actually got a little bit more leeway in that. You know, they don't get handed into exam. But I suppose if you're making a massive change, you probably do need to inform the examiners because they're going to get eyes on, on your shoemaking, your foot trim and your fit before the end of exam. Point things out. Um, for instance, you know, I've had in the past where a horse uh, has been shod by someone previous and they've massively dipped the toe out, okay? No, mat no um, amount of levelling with a rasp is going to remove that dipped toe, okay? Point that out to the examiner beforehand because they know that you haven't done it mm -hmm. and you'll say, well, we'll, well, my question will be, well, what are you going to do then? How are you going to get around that? And you'll then tell me, I might get a, put a rolled toe on it. I'm going to slightly roll the foot up, uh, the shoe up onto it, uh, whether it's a set toe, roll toe. That's what you'll be doing. But point it out and then you can have a discussion, the same as anything like a corn or if you see like a bit of an abscess or something, a bit of a black mark, just point it out. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a quick chat and then you move on. Funny, funny enough, that whole thing about, say, for example, the dip toe or drop quarter, if you've pointed that out, mm -hmm then when you do your foot trim, don't rasp over the top of it because it, make, it makes it look like you've done it then. Absolutely. So, you know, if you have got a dip toe, the last thing we want to see is you actually rasp that dip toe. You're going to come across it, um, but it will still possibly be there when you finish, same as the quarter. Mm -hmm. So, but because you pointed it out, we will know that, that it's there. Um, and uh, we, we will obviously not, penalize yourself for that for, for the, the candidate for that for doing it because they haven't done it but don't try and hide anything you know we've been around a long time we can see anything you do try and hide so uh be, be open and up front with it absolutely right so moving on to the practical use your time before you start wisely ask any questions before you panic yourself once it started all the examiners are approachable obviously apart from yourself. Um, so please speak up as soon as you have any worries or doubts. Now, this is something I drill into our students is you get around 20 minutes. Well, after you've done a trot up, there's about normally 20 minutes you've got to get your shoes off, clean your feet out, measure your feet, write your measurements down, cut your still, mark your still, all that sort of stuff before the exam starts. You know, that's not, that's not the time to go for a cigarette and have a cup of coffee. There's a lot to be done in that 20 minutes, but use that to your advantage. You know? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's the time where you can get yourself in the right frame of mind. You've asked the questions to the examiners, um, anything you're not quite right on. You make sure you've got your steel there. I, one tip I always give, I used to say to my apprentices, if you measure a foot and it's 13 inches, for instance, you need for that foot, make sure you cut a 12 and three quarters and a 12 and a quarter. Now, the college will probably go mad because you've got all this still sitting on there and tell me, ah, oh, still. But have a backup plan and have it ready to go in case you suddenly think I'm not long enough or bring I'm too own, long. If you're going to do have that, bring, bring your own still. <laughs> I, I used to tell my apprentices to do that all the time. <laughs> now, I, I do think, I might be wrong, and I need to go, I do think there is something stated on the amount of bits of steel they're allowed to cut at the start not from an examination point of view I, I as long to, as they I, I need to look into that but yeah it's um but i can remember something came up in the past about it but anyway it might have been taken out again i don't know i want to look into that um but what was i going to say the other thing and I, I i have seen a bit of this kicking around uh, and it's also a really, really good thing to have. And you only need a couple of bits. Is Everyone's always gone on about bringing a bit of, for the flat still, always having a bit of 7838 eight flat. Because <laughs> right. it sorts out those in-between feet. Yeah. So, you know, when like, if, if you are, and I know there was a dip tip based on this, where you either get three quarters and jump it, or you get inch and you draw it. Some places are selling 7838. Now, don't, for God's sake, turn up to the exam with a bit of that section, having never made a shoe from it before. Because as we all know, different sections react differently uh, when you fuller it and stuff like that. So get yourself a bit and have a practice, even make a template up, of 12 and a half inches of I don't know, seven, eight, three, uh, seven, eight, three, eight flat. But another, if you can't get it or you don't want to buy a whole bar of it, I know what I used to do is I go up to the, if you go to the, um, the steel rack, there is always a mountain of three quarter by half flat because no one ever uses it. Cut yourself 12 and a half inches of that, work it down to three, eight. Guess what you get? Seven, eight, three, eight. Mm -hmm. Or as near as that. Absolutely. Is. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally have always taught my apprentice that at the stage of four years in, if you can't forge a piece of inch down and you can't jump a piece of three quarter up, then it's a bit of a poor show. Um, so you should be able to, at that stage, have the skills to do both. And you've just got to make that decision of, of what it needs to be. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with having a piece of seven eight bar already pre-done, um, seven eight three if that's what you want to use. Um, personally, I told my apprentices that they need to learn how to forge it and do it do it correctly. But that's yeah. that's just I, how I mean, it works. The the only thing I would say to that, you know, from my perspective, watching my poor candidates go through the process, um, is on the day it's bad enough from doing the mathematics with their ruler anyway. And let's face it, most people who failed the diploma practical exam got it wrong with their ruler. Um, mm. And if, obviously, if you're going to jump it, you need to add more. If you're going to draw it, you need to cut less. Whereas, actually, if you've got a bit of 7838, it's going to have the same characteristics of, say, 13 yeah. inches of inch for eight. But, you know, that's just for people to go, we've given them the tip, go away, practice it, you know? You know, yeah, yeah. Every eventuality, you never know. Um, another tip then: do not try not. Uh, I'm about to sneeze. Sorry, I do apologise. Try to make your exam your own. Do not try to mimic what you think your examiner's shoe like at home. You know, um, the examiner's mark to the syllabus, and the task is given on the day not on how they shoe their horses at home. I mean, you, can you imagine that? Uh, it's like back in the day, I've got Simon Curtis examining me, better plate this one up. Um, well, the, the, exactly. We, we shoe at home to a way that we, we come up with for that particular horse. Okay, what works for that equine or whatever. 
like I said at the beginning, we examine to a syllabus um, and you have got to shoe that horse to the syllabus. OK, and one of the big things that I get asked a lot is what's your view as an examiner on uh, foot balance, front foot balance? And I go the T-square. Oh, but do you not think? And I go, no, I don't think anything in the syllabus. It says use a T-square. We examine to 90 degrees to the long axis. So that is what we examine to. Now, whether I agree with it or not, and I happen to agree with it on the majority of horses, that's irrelevant. Every examiner examines to the T-square. So actually, it's very simple for you candidates listening to this. Dress your feet, uh, your feet square to the long axis using a T-square, obviously on front feet. Um, and then if you come back to this tip that Danny was just saying as well, one thing I would also add is don't shoe to the same way that someone's done on the other side. Just because mm. you're second to go and someone's put, I don't know, um, seven, eight, and a half on a front foot, it doesn't mean you have to put seven, eight, and a half. It's your exam. You do it how you feel is right. Do not follow what someone else mm. has done. Now, they might have done an outstanding job, but they also might not have done a bad job and might have failed. You won't know that. So ignore what they have done do what you want to do and it's funny um i had a student of mine ask me that same exact same question last week at pre-diploma clinic and you know and like i said you know you shoe that side how you want to shoe that side and it doesn't matter what they've done on the other side you know even if they've put a toe clip behind and a side clip front on you want to do the opposite you do the opposite as long as it's the right as 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 long as it's the right task don't go, well, I don't like doing free Cotfield and Hines. I'm going to go free Cotfield and Hunt. Uh, front, sorry. That's not going to yeah. work out too well. Um, okay, next, next one. Um, so then, and this has been a bit, and I know I know the, the guy who put this one together put a lot of time and effort into um, trying to sort of like put this across in the best possible way because it has caused confusion over the years. And this is to do with the task and the shoeing cycle um, and the amount of work the horse is doing. Um, so it says here, obviously, how long should the shoe be? The current tasks that you are set in the worship company diploma exam are four, six, and eight-week shoeing cycle and light, medium, and heavy work. This replaced the different types of fit which used to be given, i.e. hunter, leisure, and roadster. It is crucial yeah. part of the diploma, uh, practical diploma test to see if a candidate can select the right section and length of steel to shoe the horse allocated on the day. The reason this is tested because once qualified, this is a decision you'll have to make on your own every day when you shoe horses. Mm. The candidate chooses to, to, uh, what the candidate use, uh, chooses to use is based on two things. The horse's overall confirmation and foot balance and the task the examiners have set, i.e. light work, medium work, or heavy work, and the length of shoeing cycle, i.e. four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. Yeah. The thing to to bring home here, and I know, obviously I've drilled this into my students, but I know there is a lot of confusion out there with some people, is because it, just because it says four week cycle doesn't mean it's going hunting. Yes, exactly. And what I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of brief history of what happened and why this has changed. Okay. As it said, we used to have hunter, leisure, and roads to fit. And that was very easy in a lot of ways, very generic. If we said hunter, you put hunter heels on it, or most did anyway. Okay. The problem with that is if you've got a horse that's got a big flat foot and a broken back hoof past an axis and you're putting hunter heels on it, it's probably not what's best for that horse's confirmation. So this came up a few times and we decided or the example decided at the time to make it that it is to make a truer test of what happens on a daily basis is you now have to make a decision of how you should shoe that horse based on its confirmation and the shoeing cycle you're given. All it means is that shoe needs to support that horse's foot and limb and the horse in general for the duration that you've been given. So four, six or eight weeks. Mm. 
So just because it says it's four weeks does not mean you have to put sloping heels on it. Now, if you've got a good foot and you want to put sloping heels on it and it's on a four week cycle, crack on. That's entirely up to you. But also, if you want to put upright heels on a four week shoe and cycle on a good foot, up to you. That's not a problem as long as it fits the foot and it supports the horse. Mm. And it comes down to the section as well. Someone said, what section should I put on it? Well, what would you do at home? Would you put seven, eight, three, eight on it? Would you put inch three, eight on it or whatever? Um, you would make that decision based on the horse's confirmation that you've got in front of you. So we are testing your ability to be able to select the right length of steel as well as the right section of steel for that horse's confirmation to cope with the length of shoeing cycle that we are dictating, which is no different to what you do when you shoe every day when the client wants to go every four weeks or every six weeks or every eight weeks for whatever reason. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, and it's, well, I say it is what it is. And it's about showing that a horse you're presented on the day. And again, you know, it goes down to, you know, we've all got performance horses. We show or just horses. We shoe for whatever reason we shoe on a four week cycle. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to show it any shorter. No. Because it, it's 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 how how long is it to the next time it's shot? That's what it's saying. The cycle, you know. Yeah, and if and if you if you take that, if you're on a four week cycle, you've got a good foot, but you go and stick, I don't know, half an inch of steel out the back of it, yeah, which is unnecessary. Mm. Then you're not you're not going to score very well. Okay, no. but if you've got a broken back hoof pattern axis and you stick half a foot inch of uh, steel out the back of the, the heel to support it and it's still on a four weeks you've done the right thing because that foot mm. needs support yeah exactly and absolutely and, and that's what we're testing we're testing your decision making rather than give you painting by numbers join yeah. those dots up we're now saying actually you tell us where the dots should be well and the key thing here this is about being sensible sensible yes. horsing you know yeah and the key thing is if you go the other way and you go too long, the chances are that that shoe is going to probably end up sitting on the frog. Yes, you don't want to be doing that. No, yeah. because that, that's a sure far way to end up getting a D, you know? So, yeah. Right, next one yeah. then. Remember, the examiners cannot tell you how to shoe that horse. It, that's the job of the candidate. It's part of the practical test. Different yeah. confirmation and work will dictate a different approach, i.e. different length of steel and section. A broken back hoof pastel axis will require more support at the hills than a correct or broken forward hoof pastel axis, regardless of the length of the shoeing cycle. Similarly, a horse in heavy work will require a thicker section of shoe than one in light work. And a flat foot will also require a broader section. As an apprentice, you make these decisions every day when working for your ATF. It's no different than the exam. And that is the key thing, that last bit. It is no different to what you do every day, except for you're only shoeing half holes and you're making the shoes for it. And you've got two hours to do it. I mean, there, there, there is enough time for you to do uh, the job that you do on a daily basis, even with making the shoes. Uh, and we've just gone over... It previously um, before this slide come up um you know you are t you are testing your ability to shoe that horse to its confirmation we can't tell you how to shoe it we can't even suggest how you should shoe it um that's your decision so don't ask how long should i shoe this horse because it we, my answer would be what's appropriate for that horse's confirmation with the task that we've set you yeah okay and that, that's, that's your, your decision. When it's the same with section, you know, as a guide, if you've got a flat foot, it's going to need a wider section. If you've got a thinner, sort of smaller, boxier foot, it can take a narrower section. So, you know, these are guides. They're not rules. Um, but uh, it's what's appropriate for that horse. You know, and in a lot of these cases... You know, when you go back to you and you think about your basics, you know, and people are always on about, you know, trimming the, trimming the foot back to its normal proportions. Now, we know in this country that, 
you know, if you if you if you were to chop every horse's feet down to the widest part of the frog, you can end up with a lot of very low heeled horses. But if you can't a lot of blood on the floor. Well, if you can't <laughs> if you can't trim them to the widest part of the frog, you can at least fit the shoe to the widest part of the frog in most cases. Yeah. You know, and that's a pretty good broad, you know, broad kind of aiming point, you know. You can't go yes. much wrong with that, you know. So no. No. Um, so there's obviously if this person who was going on about the shoeing cycle starts going on a bit here, but um, a horse on a four week shoeing cycle can be shod with less length at the hill as it's only got to stay in place for four weeks, you know, which is obvious. You know, that's why when we go back to the old styles, you know, when we talked about hunter shoeing, it was a three to four week cycle because it hasn't got as much to grow into. So likewise, I mean, I think the key thing with what this, what we're saying here is like a horse in an eight week cycle can be shot even longer as it needs to replay main in place, you know, twice the amount of distant uh, time as a four week cycle. You know, if you shoot it as a four week cycle by week five, that shoe is no longer going to fit. Yeah, and you don't want the shoe, uh, the foot growing over the shoe and the shoe suddenly ends up inside you know, grown off uh, inside the foot and the foot's growing out over the edge and, and the shoe is no longer being supported, supporting the heels of the foot. No. You don't want that. And that's what the idea of the cycle is. It needs to do its job for the duration that you've been set, four, six or eight weeks. Yeah. Um, and that's just quite simple, really, when you think about it. Um, that's all it's got to do. No different at work. On a daily basis, that client says, I want my horse to go every six weeks. And then after three weeks, the shoes, the foot's growing all over your shoe because you've put too small a shoe on it. Mm. You've got a problem. And that's yeah. what we're testing. Yeah. Just a quick one for anyone listening. Um, obviously, if I listen to this on the podcast, the video for this is also going up on the YouTube channel. So obviously, we've actually on the YouTube, we've got the PowerPoint presentation running and you can actually see the slides and see exactly what we're talking about. So check that one out. Uh, moving on to the next slide then. It's a bit blurry, this one. But um, so a horse with low weak heels, as a rule, poorly conformed feet need more support than a well-conformed foot. A horse on a four-week mm -hmm. shearing cycle we need to be shod with more support on the hills than that of a good foot. So obviously this goes to what we were talking about uh, two slides ago. You know, if you yeah. do, if you are unfortunate enough to get a horse with collapsed hills, then chew it accordingly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. you know, absolutely. Give it something to stand on. Uh, and I'm not saying st stick huge amounts of steel out the back and the side and etc but fit it to the proportion of that horse, which is, which is adequate, you know, mm. uh, make sure your, your heel is in the center of the steel. That's a big one. Um, you, when you, when you come around the corner and you've got to cover your heel, well, it should be sitting in the middle yeah. as, as a guide. Um, so many times I see feet, shoes that are not fitted to the heel and it's off the heel or it's wrapped in too much and it's into the frog. Keep it symmetrical. Mm -hmm. Keep it in the middle of the, the section. I mean, and the key thing as well, when you if if you do look on the YouTube channel and see this slide, when you look at the lines on this <coughs> picture indicating a four week fit, six week fit, and an eight week fit, the difference between an eight and four weeks fit is a good heat and two licks of a rasp. Absolutely. You know, we're not, we're not, yeah, we're there's not, not much in it. You know, there's not that much in it, really. You know, so if you did turn out, and this always gets me when people, I, I can handle people who end up fitting a shoe which is too long if they do something about it, because you can do, you might lose a bit of, um, you might lose a few shoemaking marks because the heels don't look as tidy as what they could have looked but you're not going to lose the points on your fit. No. You no. know, and that, yeah. and that, most of it is lost on the fit. Yeah, the exactly. shoemaking skills and the fit um, is what tends to candidates tend to, to, to come unstuck with. Mm. So, so right. Um, obviously, obviously if you've got a good foot and a good hoof pass, that's is a good foot. Uh, sorry, a good foot shot adequately for four to six weeks. It does not require excessive amount of support as it's well conformed 
strong foot. It would be mm. considered too short for an eight-week cycle, though. Obviously, this is the picture we're looking for. So, you know, you can clearly see the bulbs of the hill. And although the shoe is making contact with the foot, mm. and, you know, you would get away with that. But if it was an eight-week cycle, you would be crossing that threshold into doesn't fit. Yeah, because the foot is going to continue to grow. The shoe is going to grow forward and it'll be off the hill um, by eight weeks. And that's the point. So you would have to give that a little bit more to stand on. Mm. Um, I'm not saying a massive amount, but you just have to bear that in mind that it's got to do its job for the duration. I know I'll keep repeating myself, but it really is key that that's the whole point of it. It needs to stay in place and support that horse for the duration that you're set. And I say is the key thing as well. And like most, especially on a good, good solid footed horse, you know, most candidates are going to put a toe clip on it. And the one thing we know about toe clips is as that foot grows down and out and forward, that toe clip, it just takes the whole shoe with it. So, yeah. you know, you've, you've got to take all those things into consideration. Um, and again, we've got another picture here, you know, and again, you really need to see the YouTube to kind of get the most out of this section. Obviously, this is a side on view of a poor low, low heeled horse. Um, and the red line indicates at a point of the hill, obviously showing to the red line, uh, confirmation, even on a four week cycle is not adequately supported, mm. you know? So again, and that's the key. If you've actually got a low heeled horse, to, to be honest, you're going to be shoeing it the same length because um, it needs it. It needs to be supported for with whichever the shoeing cycle you're given. Um, so, you know, but bear that in mind. I think uh, that, that that's the, the sort of take home message that shoe it to the horse's confirmation. Yeah. I mean, that, and, but the other thing as well, you know, that being a hind foot, mm. um, I'm assuming it is. <laughs> but yes, it that, is, yeah. Thank goodness. Um, but that being a hind <laughs> foot, you know, you remember with hind feet, you can get away with a little bit more length than you would do with a front foot because nothing's going to pull it off from behind, not unless it's working in team, you know? No, but there's nothing worse than seeing a good foot. I know this is a bad one. We're talking about a bad one here, but on the flip side of that, if you see a good foot that is overshod, mm. that is actually not good and it's not and it can be detrimental because it's sticking out too much and and it's a, a hazard waiting to be pulled off whether it's by another horse running up behind it or whether it's on a trailer when it's being loaded or etc so um it's just got to shoot to what it, and that particular photo that we're looking at yeah that horse needs that support all day long yeah um so whatever cycle i would shoot it to that length absolutely right take home message for that part of it then um, to do with the kind of uh shoeing cycle and the fit remember it's your choice what section of length of steel you use that's part of the wcf diploma test the decision is based on the horse's confirmation and the shoeing task cycle that the examiner set the shoe has to remain in place and support the foot and limb for the duration of the shoeing cycle as a good foot confirmation requires less support and less length for the hills as part of a poor foot and as a guide a poor foot requires more support of the hills i.e broken by hoof pass and access these are only guidelines and it is the skill of the farrier to select the correct length and section of shoe when shoeing horses and you know it is pretty basic you know and the, these different fits we are talking about like in them photographs we're talking marginal differences you know, we're not talking add an extra inch. We're talking add an extra eighth. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, and uh, that, that's the key. And then it's really that last bit, you know, these are guides and it is you. we're testing your skill to come up with the right length and section for that horse. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's it in a nutshell, really. Absolutely. Um. So moving on to the actual practical exam itself, you know, we've got – um just a few slides of some of these dip tips um which appeared um on the bfba site and is obviously going to appear in the next edition of forge magazine and the reason we're talking about all this because it has been published on facebook is the fact that you know to actually 
we know a lot of people are listening to podcasts now, um, you know, as part of revision that drive around in their trucks and on car journeys. Um, and it was just a to put them onto a talking type platform, but also just to discuss them because I dare say there are, you know, some of the tips there are, there are pros and cons, you know, and again, how someone puts down a tip sometimes doesn't always translate to everyone. Sometimes it needs explaining. So that's what we're going to do. So if his first um, practical tip is about using blank shoes. It just says uh, tip number one, use blank shoes to, to get a good idea of how the section you've chosen will look on the foot. Some feet will take three quarter three eight and others will take seven eight three eight. One will look better than the other. As long as the blank shoes are out of the forge before the exam starts, then this is fine. But again, go back to what we said earlier. Turns out you they've got to be out 30 minutes after the exam starts now. So, but that's a good one. And I say it to people. I mean, another another alternative for doing that is get two bits of off cut and just actually stick the off cut over the heel of the horse. Sometimes you'll have, you know, especially with some of these chunky cob colored ponies, they might have a, a 12 inch foot which kind of says to you, well, I want to put three quarter three eight on it. But actually, because of the, how chunky the hills are and how fit the wall is, you need a bit more material to cover that. So, yeah. And that that's a, how you measure your foot and what you decide to put on it is, is down to you. I mean, I always encourage my apprentices to use templates and um, blank shoes to get the section and also the length. So, and it also is good shoemaking practice in getting them all, before the exam you've got these Absolutely. whole bank of Absolutely. shoes there you can go in and you can put one on it also there is nothing wrong with using a ruler um i i use a ruler all the time um and if that's what you use that's what you use whatever method you use use it another one that i used to say to my apprentices with and this is a tip that's probably not on there is you've also got machine made shoes now Let's just pick any shoe that we want. If we use a, a, a Kerr cart number two, that's roughly 13 inches. Mm. So if you didn't have a blank or, or you've got your blank and it doesn't quite look right and you go outside and you, you've got a Kerr cart number two, you go, right, well, that's, I know, 13 inches roughly. So mm. I'm in that area. Combine that with your measurement, you'll know whether you're there or not. Mm. Um, so there's nothing wrong with using machine-made shoes as long as you know what they should be. Mm. All, um, I, all I would say to that, Simon, and I'm not disagreeing with you, is but if you've got the opportunity beforehand to actually make the templates to shape your, especially when it's the, your normal go-to sort of like stock shape or whatever, A, it's extra practice of making the shoes. Because let's face it, you don't want to be practicing bar shoes and corking wedges leading up to your diploma. You should have made your shoe board a long time ago. Mm. The bread and butter shoes are the ones you need to be making. But I did have a student a few years ago who turned up with a box of various concave machine-made shoes. And when I sort of said, what are you playing at? He was like, yeah, but I know how much I would cut to make this. And I actually made a right pig's ear of it. You know. I, th I, think, I think what I was trying to get at is that wh when you're working on a daily basis, when you trim a foot, you go to the van and you get a shoe to fit that foot. Yeah. You make a decision, whether it's a Stromy number two, whether it's a handmade shoes number eight or nine or whatever. You know what that foot roughly wants by just visually looking at it. Now I'm not don't don't use that as the only guide, but you'll you'll have a rough idea that mm. if I was at home, I would get a Stromy two out and put that on there. I know it's going to be around that size. Measure it, mm. and it confirms it. Or go, well, actually, I need a bit more, yeah, because my measurements are telling me that. But it's a quick way of going. What would I put on that at home? What size? Yeah, it, exactly. and, and you 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 do it all the time. Good shoemakers that do competitions, etc. Yes, they'll get their ruler out, but they've got an idea in their head before mm. they start because they know what size foot that is, mm. what they would do at home. Yeah. The bit I just want to add on that, and like I say, I, I always advise my guys and girls to use templates because if you can use them, why wouldn't you? But the thing is, they still need to measure the width and length and the hill distance and all that stuff because when it comes to fitting that, 
when that comes out of the fire and you've clipped it, it needs to measure those measurements before you embark on that journey to the foot. Because if it don't, it ain't going to fit and you've wasted five minutes, you know. Totally. Yeah, yeah. You still need that and you need a little board beside you where you can write down these measurements so you can quickly look. It's a five and a quarter foot um, and it's, I don't know, two and a half inches between the hills or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you've got that there. So you, do, you still need to measure it. But templates, for me, are a great thing for getting your shoemaking before you're starting. So you, you're practicing, mm. running up to the exam. And it's a really quick measuring tool to have uh, in there. I would also use a ruler and the templates just to confirm it. Let's mm. get this right. It's yeah. an important day. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, I, and I was saying to some students the other day, the thing with templates, if you make your normal go-to stock shape for your template shape, so that's mm. probably, you know, when you vision a shoe, that's the shape you make. If you go and put it on that foot and that foot straighter, straight away, you know, you've got to make my shape, but straighter. If it's, yeah. if it's hooked on at the heels, my shape, but it hooks on at the heels, you know, yeah. or yeah. if it's slightly sort of distorted and it's straighter on the outside, you you can, you can process that. And you've got a great picture in your head of what you've got to do next. So, right, number two then, do not hesitate to ask the examiners anything regarding the practical exam. This is a patterns emerging here where it, this asking questions to the examiners, obviously but now we're talking about the actual practical exam itself, whether that's a question about your foot or your nail placement, they won't tell you what you, to do, but they can certainly advise you regarding any of the questions within the guidelines and the rules yeah. of examination. I think one of the key things here in the past, over and over again, there's been candidates with a question they wanted to ask, but they didn't have the confidence maybe to ask it or thought that maybe they weren't supposed to ask questions without digging a hole for themselves and have ended up having a bad exam run just because then everything started to unravel, you know, like say, all these keep saying the examiner's not going to tell you what to do, but they can advise and steer you in the right direction from a certain point of view. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's nothing more than examiners want to do than to pass every single candidate in front of them. You know, that, that would make me very happy. And I know the whole exam team would be very happy if we could pass every person that we examine. But they've got to meet the criteria. They've got to meet the standard. And that, that is crucial. And if we're talking about nail placement, you know, I'll give you an instant. If, if you decide to put three nails in a foot or you want to put four nails in a foot, that's entirely up to you. Um, but if you put a nail in, you, you punch a nail in and it's in the wrong place, then punch another one. But tell the examiner which nail you're going to use. Yeah. And, and that's, that's important because, you know, there's nothing wrong with having the nail in the wrong We all do it, put it a bit too far back or oh, it's in the wrong place. Then, or, or leave it out. If, if you've got three nails either side and then you suddenly decide actually one of them is going to be a bit close or it's not in good horn, I'm actually going to leave it out. I'd much rather see five good nails in there than six bad ones or well, five good ones and one bad one that's going to cause you a problem. It's an interesting topic because there's been so many myths on nail holes over the years about, you know, if you put eight nails in there, you put, uh, eight holes in there, you better put eight nails in it because you don't put a nail in unless you're going to use it. And, you know, we've seen it, you know, in the last couple of years where – Candidates have gone coarse with a toenail. They've handed the shoe in. The examiner's handed it back to them, not told them what to do, but kind of advised along the lines of, you can use that toenail if you want, but you don't have to. Because, quite frankly, they're running the risk of, of stabbing the horse, which that's down to them at that point. They can either use it. Yes, they might lose a point on the nail and finish, or a couple of marks, but they're not going to fail because of it, you know. And I think that, you know, that's no. that's caused a lot of um, things in the past. And it's, you know, it's taken examiners to come in and do clinics and actually spell that out to them to get the message across to them. 
Um, you know, a, another incident which happened, and I'm going to name and shame because I did promise him that day that I would do for the rest of his life. George Rogerson, the current lockdown league champion, um, on his exam day, completely lost his plot, had to make a second concave front shoe, for some bizarre reason, put about 12 nail holes in it. I think what had happened, he it, it misstamped where he wanted his nail holes to go, so he stamped them again and thought, well, I won't pritchel them, and ended up then pritcheling them. So he'd got like 12 nail holes and he looked at me and said, what to do? I'm, I don't know. No one's ever been that stupid. Um, and I, what he did in the end was he got a piece of chalk. He marked the six nail holes he meant to use and gave it to the examiner and went, right, I've kind of I've removed my nail holes, but these are the six I'm going to use. And they said, yeah, fine by us. You know, it's no, no, no one ever failed for putting extra nail holes in. No, that, that's cool. <laughs> Like I said at the beginning, this exam is about safety. Are you safe? Can you make good decisions? And we all make mistakes. We all put nails in the wrong place, um, no matter what stage of your career you're in. So, but as long as you tell the examiner that, and if you come up to me and said, I'm not using that nail hole, or I've, I've re-stamped that side because it wasn't right, you've shown to me that you're thinking and you've got initiative, and I go, no problem. That's fine. So, and I'll say to you, you want that one, that one, and that one. And you go, yeah, then I will only mark those nail holes. Yes, you will be knocked slightly because of your shoemaking, because you made a mistake. Let's just, just be honest about it. Yeah, exactly. But you're not going to fail an exam because you put an extra nail hole in and then not used it. What I'm not saying to everybody is to go in, put in 12 nail holes in a shoe and then selecting the six that they want to use. Uh, the no. three, Yeah, the, the, the six that they want to use. That, to, again, is not good shoemaking. But if you make a mistake, don't be frightened to redo it and tell the examiners you've done it. And not just that. If you're going to put 12 nail holes in the shoe, you're probably going to break your pritchel. Probably. And it's also <laughs> time you don't need to do it, et cetera, no, exactly. et cetera. So, um, yeah. So th th that's, a, that's a sort of um, a common mistake that people make. Um, and uh, it's an unnecessary one, really. Right, so tip number three, and this is one I really, really do like because it's something I, I, I use myself and it's got me out, especially at competitions, it's got me out, it's managed to claw me points back. And when the exam starts, trim both front, trim both feet and then have a break from the horse. Go back to the anvil, put your toe bends in on both your shoes and then set up, set up your outsides. After this, go back to your feet and review your foot balance for level and tidiness. This way, you won't get locked into the feet and have a fair better chance to actually see what the examiners see when they view the feet. One of the things I always go about, if you look at something long enough, you start to miss the point. Yeah. And I know that if I trim a foot and I think, yeah, it looks fine. If I go back and come back with fresh eyes five minutes later, then mm. all, all the mistakes start jumping out at me, you know, and I think that's a very good point. The only thing I would say to that, just to kind of tidy that one up, is remember, most people spend on average 20 minutes trimming the two feet on the exam day. Um, that gives you then 10 minutes before the examiners are going to do them feet. By the time you've jumped up a toe, whacked a toe bend in and turned the other toe, that's probably all you're going to, as far as you're going to get. Put your toe bends in, then go and have a look. It's long enough to freshen your eyesight up. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm totally, I mean, I was going to mention exactly that. You should have a process for doing this exam when it comes to assessing, to trimming your feet, and it should all be timed. You know how long it takes to trim feet. You shouldn't be taking more than... 15 to 20 minutes to trim two front feet to be honest with you and you should be practicing that at home yeah i used to get my apprentices doing that i used to time them i used to time myself when i was practicing for my exams well i'm going to trim these two feet in 15 minutes and that's it and then i'd get someone to mark them but after trim your feet walk away put your toe bend in even if it's only one shoe go back and have a look and reassess because you will the more you play around with it, the worse it will get half the time. Um, so get them trimmed like you do at home on a daily basis. Don't over trim it. Don't under trim it. Just trim the foot how you do at home. And that's the key. 
to the syllabus, though. You must trim to the syllabus. Absolutely. Right. Moving on. Um, this one for me is controversial. I don't know. I've, I've, I've mentioned that to you earlier. However, if this tip works for you, I mean, the downside to it, you're going to give away time you haven't got. Um, you know, but it is a tip. If you do struggle with measurements and you're not using templates, then this may assist you. But once you've formed and turned the outsides of each of your shoes, go over to the horse and hover the shoe over the foot. This should give you an idea of the shape and size and whether it will go on or not. Do not let the shoe contact the foot unless you're sure the feet have been marked or you're at least 30 minutes into the exam. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, however you get to the process, uh, you go through the process, and however you get to the end result, if it's good enough to pass, it will pass. Now, if that is works for you and you do that, then fine. Personally, I never encourage my apprentices to do that because it wastes time. For me, mm. build a shoe at the anvil. You've got measurements that you've just got off the horse and written on your board that we just talked about. So if it says it's five and a quarter wide and you measure it and it's six and a quarter wide, you've got a problem. Yeah. It needs to be narrowed up, reshaped, or you need to start again. So at the end of the day, build the shoe at the anvil to the measurements you've got, walk over to the horse, and it should more or less then fit. Yeah, and that, that that that's that's what I would do. Mm. Running back and forth. I also think in an exam, you do get nervous. You do shake. Yeah. You are a bit all over the place. There is a high likelihood that you might end up touching the shoe um, on the foot, um, which you don't really want to do. So, at the end, of, I wouldn't do that, and I'm not sure for me how much I would get out of that. But if that's a process that you do and you've been doing that for four years and it works for you, mm. don't change it at this stage just because me and Danny said that we wouldn't no. do it. No. Okay. I Carry mean, on and do it, but make sure that you follow the rules. It, it's something, again, like I say, from day one of shoemaking training with my students, everything's building up right from day one to the last day, which is exam day. Um mm. And, you know, we put those measuring points in. So you should never have to do that. However, I do say to the students, the only, the only time that I, well, I won't say I allow that, but the only time I think that's acceptable, if you stick your ruler on it at any point and it, you, you think are oh, miles out, rather than just chuck the shoe in the bin, on the way to the bin, run over to the foot, in obviously mm. a safe way without startling the horse and just look at it before you chuck it in the bin because yeah, yeah. actually you might it might just turn out but it it needed that extra steel and your measurements were actually out you know yeah rather yeah. than just ch give up and chuck it in the bin just have a quick look because yeah, you might check find, it. you might find that it's it's workable you know that's the only thing i would say but again i've spent a long time with my sat in the forge with a stop clock doing sort of time motion studies and the, re the reality of it, each time that you come off at hand, they'll go over to the horse, pick the foot up and people might sound, think this sounds daft, but I'll, I've, I've studied it. Every time you leave your hand, they'll go to the horse, pick the foot up, brush the foot out, think about whatever it is you're hovering over the foot or trying to fit onto the foot and go back and put that still back in the fire. That's five minutes gone. You know. Yeah, totally. And, and, and especially, um, you know, if you take Hereford, the anvil, the, the forges aren't too near the horses. They no. are a bit near at Warwick, um, but at Hereford, they're not. So don't waste that time running back and forth. It's energy that you don't need to waste. To, um, to, to be honest, the thing with that, Simon, I've looked at that in different forges as well. And actually, the distance from horse, horse to anvil doesn't actually affect the time. Right, okay. You know, if, if it was like you was going to the next stable yard, <laughs> yeah, then it, it would. It's, but it, it, it's, it's a funny phenomenon because I've done it at home. I've done it, at, you know, I've even clocked people at competitions, you know, qualified guys, you know, where the anvil's very close to the horse. And it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually make it's a lot still, of difference. It's still time. You don't need to waste. Um, exactly. And so it is a good tip to, to 
if you're going to give up on the shoe, just check it before you give up on it. Yeah. Um, because you might be able to stretch it or you might be able to crop it and it might still work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, number five, during the practical exam, stay, and this kind of goes along the similar line, during the practical exam, stay in touch with the shape of your feet when making your shoes. You can do this by making regular visits over to the horse, picking up the feet whilst your steel is getting hot. This will ensure that your shoes actually look like the feet and will save time on fitting. My worry, yeah, um, my, my, my worry there is, yes, that's even more trips to the foot, but who's keeping an eye on your metal whilst it's burning away in your fire? Exactly. I mean, again, you should photograph your feet, in, no, not with a camera, that's mm. for sure, but photographic memory, you know the shape of your feet. But even if you haven't got a great concept of just by looking you're not not that experienced with that yet you've got measurements yeah so you should be a and it's not just the width and between the heels you can also measure your toenails you can also measure where your clips want you can use calipers mm. that you can say right well you know that's that's the width of my toe for instance mm. set your calipers on there put that on your shoe there's so many measuring devices that yeah. you can use to save you running backwards and forwards looking at feet um Sometimes you have no choice. Uh, I have days what I call no fit, uh, can't fit, won't fit days, where I, I go back and forward to horses five, six times because I, I can't quite get it right, and it takes me that to get it. Well, if I'm not, you do have to do that, don't panic. You've I'm not going to lie. When I have days like that, Simon, I go twice, then turn the linisher on. <laughs> Linishers are not allowed in the flow rings out. It's only a matter of time. Come on, wake up. Um, <laughs> no, um, uh, just going back to that one, though. Um, a, a thing which works for me, and again, I, I build this into my teaching, is especially when it comes to shoeing feet, I have a different way of doing stock shoes, but when it comes to shoeing feet, calipers, central cleft to the centre of the hill, that's where you mark your start, your fulling, or certainly your toenail, from the center point of your shoe. And yeah. when you make the shoe, as long as your width's right and your length's right, and the shape's kind of the same as the foot, and that toenail then is parallel to the center of the heel, when you line it up, put yeah. the toes up on the side of the anvil, that should fit first time. Or yeah, least, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, close enough. It, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, that, that kind of works for me, and that just saves on trips to that foot. You know, I've, and I think Absolutely. for my fitting, certainly from a competition and exam point of view, that was one of the biggest game changers of getting that first time hit rate. Because again, going back to the five minute per trip thing, um, and going another, another curveball just to chuck in there. Now, we all know that Warwick, they've got gas forges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you put both bits of steel in and you've got time whilst they're getting hot, and that horse is stood next to you, by all means, go and have a look, you know, because yeah. they're not going to yeah. burn. And actually, you're just going to be stood there waiting for the two bits still to get hot. But yeah. other than that, that opportunity isn't really there. You know, if you just, you're just doing something practical in a bit of dead time, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't think to do that at Hereford for sure. But um, again, going back to the five minutes per tr trip. Now, if you have, and this is worth thinking about, if you get a first-time fit of your front shoe and a first-time fit of your hind shoe, so you're going to go over to the foot, burn your clips in, oh, my God, my shoe fits. So now you're going to go back to the anvil, you're going to rasp that shoe up and then get a light all over heat and go and have a final burn on. So that's two trips per foot. So that's four trips in total. So that's mm. 20 minutes walking backwards and forwards for a first-time fit. And again, I, one of the biggest things i see why people fail is when the fitting process unravels and it's normally because they cut too much or not enough still and they start to panic and they start trying to force it to fit when they start going to the foot four five six even seven times you can probably say you're going to run out of time at that point it's the back end of the exam what i always say where they fail on because they start trimming feet they do that on time, um, 
they start making shoes they sort of have their first shoe out roughly in about an hour and then they faff yeah i mean before you know it half an hour's gone and they still haven't given you the first shoe they still haven't rasted up they haven't even looked at the second shoe yet because they're concentrating on one and before you know it it's done but, um I, I think that uh, yeah I say, let's move on to this next one then. Make sure that the shoes are the same shape as the feet. Don't make nice specimen-shaped shoes and then spend 20 minutes trying to reshape them. You know, the examiners see this on every exam. It's good to be able yes. to solve a problem, but you're better off not having that problem in the first place. And that is a very, very sound piece of advice. You know, yeah. Make shoes for feet. And if you practice that at home, you'll do it. One of the things I used to get my apprentices doing and um, I used to join in with them was um, literally look at a foot and see who can make and fit that shoe the quickest. Yeah. Right. So it's literally like a one heat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was, you used to take a couple of heats to do it, but it was like make and fit, no messing around over to the foot and on. And, um, you know, you're trying to do it. It's about 10 minutes. Roughly. We all got to about that sort of stage. Um, but it gets you looking at feet, photographing it in your mind, going away, making a shoe to come back and get on that foot in one go. I believe it's, it's a very called, slow little tweak. I believe it's called an eagle eye, Simon. Well, you can still keep looking at the foot. That's the difference is that, and one thing I do on a daily basis is while I'm shoemaking, if the horse is in front of me, I keep looking at its feet. Mm. You know, I, I look up and I go, oh yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. It's got a quarter there or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah use that if they're in front of you look at it don't have to walk over there you can actually see it and it'll just jog your memory of what um what the foot shape is yeah it, it, it's it's and it's it's a good teaching technique that it's something now now we've got a new freezer and it's full of dead legs at, at college it's something I, I use even the block ones the last block ones we had i mean their shoemaker was that good i mean they blew me away i'm not gonna I'm, you know um so i was having to mix mix it up a bit because i didn't want them to get bored so yeah we, we did a few eagle eyes and you know they got a lot a lot out of it especially when it yeah. comes to foot shapes and stuff um Definitely. right last last one then really um just finished on shoe board um it's basically just says that uh, you simple well forged shoes for your shoe board shoes you make for specific horses or shoes with a story behind them are always good uh, don't overcomplicate things and make sure you're familiar with the mechanics and functions of all the shoes on your board because remember you're going to use these shoes but you're going to be asked questions on them in your oral aren't you so yeah you know, yeah I the key to that is mechanics and functions. Yeah. All right. You know, every shoe has a mechanical function um, and you need to understand what they are um, and make sure don't ever put a shoe on there that you have no idea how it fits. I bet examiners love it when people come in and you say, what's this shoe for? And they go, I don't know. It was a forging exercise. I think yeah, students, because students generally think that that's their get out of jail free card. And I don't think it washes. <laughs> well, it isn't because what happens then is I'll pick a subject to talk to you about that. You might not want to talk about because I'm not trying to catch you out, but if your shoe board is not giving me anything to go by, I might start talking to you about gait mm. or landing and loading of, of limbs and things <laughs> like that. That is all part of, the, the the syllabus and is all relevant to shoe boards but you might not want to talk about that mm. you know so put shoes on there that you are freely happy to talk about so that we've got something to talk about and then that your time goes pretty quickly um yeah. again putting boring shoes on there i shouldn't say that really because all of them are on there and you can pick any ones from the syllabus but try and have some sort of interest in shoes as well but you've got to know about those shoes yeah um because they're great talking points you know things like um rope pins if you've got rope pins in a shoe and you use rope pins at home put one in a shoe or put two whichever ones you want to use so it gives us as examiners to go right okay rope pins let's talk about placement let's talk about what they do is there any other grip devices you can you can see how this can lead on to different things um and remember, it's about the shoes. It is not about the fancy board that you're putting them on. I really 
don't care what your board looks like, as in what it's attached to, the shoes are attached to. Um, mm. I've seen some great ones over the years and some absolutely amazing ones. But um, I, <laughs> it's, it's definitely about she. I'm just remembering a, a, a conversation I had with Sandy Beveridge about shoes and um, a candidate come over before we, we made it generic now that it's a metre by metre flat board. Um, and he had this lovely sort of um, uh, cabinet with the shoes inside and he plonked it on the table in front of Sandy, which he now couldn't see the examiner and opened up the doors so you could see the shoes. And Sandy slid it to one side and said, you should have put a window in that. <laughs> he couldn't actually see the candidate. And I, it just made me laugh when he told me that because you just think, yeah, exactly. It's nothing to do with the shoe board. It's to do with the shoes. It used to always absolutely boil my water when you would had students who probably had the worst shoes in that exam sitting and put no effort into the shoemaking over the four years, but spent a lot of time, money, creating a massively stupid, overcomplicated piece of wood. Yeah. Yeah, and you're getting shoes that haven't been finished properly, haven't been rasped or, or filed or even brushed. We've got, you know, um, rust marks on them, um, for instance. And I look at a shoe board and I go, this is a representation of you of four years of work. Mm. Um, you know, at this end stage, you've got an accumulation of your work and you are showing your skills to me as an examiner and if that's the best you can do then it may it raises questions about what you can do on a practical basis in front of you mm. so we mark the shoe boards normally halfway through roughly the exam not always can be sometimes before depends on the the the, the rounds um but it does when you see a poor shoe board i'll be honest with you most poor shoe boards go with poor practical skills on the exam they yeah. normally go hand in hand no yeah i totally agree um you know and again i don't there's no reason in a lot of cases why a shoe board should fail i mean i know again we've got it down to the sort of art of the fact that you know i and i'd say same with all my colleagues who i work with we know the difference between a pass and a foul we know what the diploma standard is because that's what we teach at but we always get them now to present their boards on the first Monday of Block 8, which then gives us at least that first week to write any of the wrongs or get things remade if necessary. Because you'd be surprised what people do put on the boards to start with. Um, and that just rules out. So everything sort that shoe boards done and dusted either by day one or day certainly by the wednesday and then they've got the rest of the two weeks to worry about the theory and the practical exam it's out of the way yeah. and i'm going to worry about it one final dip tip i'm really going to talk about um and that's really um about time management and knowing where you should be at what time and that kind of pertains to rasping filing and sanding yeah because again um, you know, me, me and my stop clock, we've been at it again. And I've actually counted someone spending at least 20 minutes filing, rasping and sanding a shoe and then wondering why they ran out of time. You know, it's yeah. kind of, if you've got time to do let's face it, you could pass your diploma with a hammer finished shoe if, if needed. Absolutely. And that's one thing. You will fail your diploma exam if you don't finish on time. I don't care how good the job is, how polished it is, and how amazing it is when it's eventually finished. If you go over that two hours, you fail. Simple. No, no get out of jail free card with that one. If you haven't got time and you've hammer boxed it and you've hammer fish, finished it um, and you know, even if you haven't had time to brush it as well as you could have done, but there's no sharp edges. It fits. It's the correct size for the foot, et cetera, et cetera. You'll pass the exam. Mm. You, won't, you won't fail it just because you haven't rasped it. You will if you've not rasped a sharp edge off 
and it's detrimental. Don't get me wrong. But what you've got to remember is it's not about the finish. It all adds to it. If you've got time to do it, great. But if you haven't, just get the shoe on the foot mm. and the shoes on the feet. And that, that is key. Um, and I say that to people all the time. You know, learn to forge and hammer box and finish with a hammer because you might need it. Well, also, um, I mean, it might be... I mean, I, I, I tend to implement that with most of my shoemaking, purely and simply, because even if you are going to rasp it, it means less rasping. You yeah, know, yeah, time. You it know, comes down to time again. You, you're just you're finishing off and cleaning as opposed to doing the heavy lifting with a rasp. And one thing, and I'm not having a dig at any apprentice because this has happened to us qualified guys as well. Ever since the we all got linishes in the back of our van. We have actually lost the ability to hot rasp effectively. And it's like... You, you lose the, the, the fitness. You, well, and, and it's and, almost and like... Process. You pick a rasp up now, the first thing you're looking for is the on button. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, no, I mean, but that, yeah. is, that is a big thing I see. And cold yeah. rasp... <coughs> cold rasping as well. Very often, if you're going to cold rasp it, the rasp is not going to do anything. No, and it just highlights anything on the shoe that isn't. Um, it's the same as these sanding systems. Sanding system used well mm. is is looks good, but if yeah. you've got a shoe that's unlevel, yeah, uh, or, or not unlevel, but it's not forged flat and crisp, and you start putting a sanding system over it, it'll pick up every high spot going, and it'll make it look horrible. So I wouldn't use one. Used well, they're great, and it's the same as sanding and, and feet when you're doing your nail and finish overuse it and your clenches start getting proud on the feet you're going to lose marks yeah um used well it looks amazing i remember a candidate at hereford i'll give you the praise for this who got honors and their their sanding their, their finish i couldn't even get anywhere near it and we we looked at examiners we looked at each other and we went oh my god look at that that is like it was like glass. He had the time to do it, and um, it was an amazing job. He must have gone through all the different processes to get there, and you could do nothing but give it top marks mm. because it was perfect. So done well, it's amazing. Done poorly, it highlights all the oh, problems. Oh, yeah. I always said that the, 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 the sandbox was the greatest tool to help competition judges ever because you didn't have to look for the mistakes they jumped out at you um you know yeah if it's if it's poorly used and, yeah. and, and but it's the same as a rasp if a rasp mm. is poorly used then it is it's, mm. it's always going to highlight the problems isn't it yeah um so uh just it, you know from a time management point of view i mean i know um competing if i if I've gone past a certain time threshold when I'm rasping up and I haven't got time to use it, I literally, my files and sandbox on the floor, I kick, I kick out of the way so I can't use them. You know, because mm. the trouble yeah, is, yeah. These, these people, they'll go out before the exams and they will buy all these sanding systems, sandboxes, sharp files and all that. They've invested that money. They're going to use them whether they, whether they want to or not, you know. Um and it's always great yeah. because you, you've got to get a process it's i've got i've got a box i've got a box full of um sanding strips where guys have brought a massive bucket load of the stuff done their diploma exam and on the way out have gone do you want these because i'm not going to use them again so <laughs> I, i've got i've got enough sanding strips of life it's brilliant um but yeah <laughs> I, I, well i think that but your time management we would i just just finish on the time management. Get your easier shoe out quickly, as quick as you can. Get that into the examiner. Yeah. Try. I try to used to tell my apprentices, you want them really be looking at it and marking that on the hour to an hour and 20 minutes. Mm. Okay. So your concave shoe, if you've got a concave, get that one in, fitted, rasp, done, into them, on your box, ready to be nailed on. And then you concentrate on your other shoe. For the rest of your time um and you you know you don't want to be with five minutes to go and you've not even done a fit 
because you've concentrated all on one shoe. Manage the two together, but get you easier one out first. That's what I always do. To... Yeah, and I think that is really good advice because, again, the amount of times you see, you always get one person, they get to the end, they're a bit behind anyway, and they hand both exams in, uh, sorry, both shoes in at the same time when everyone else is handing shoes in and they've only got like five, ten minutes left. There is no way they're going to get their marks because both examiners have got to mark them. You know, both ex- both Farry examiners have got to mark them. The vet doesn't have to, but both right. Farry examiners, and we have to be given time to give you a fair mark and everyone else. So we can't suddenly just go, oh yeah, just put it on. No, we've got to mark it. So, and that's your fault if you haven't give us enough time to do it. No. So yeah, like I say, you don't want to be standing waiting for a shoe. You could be nailing one on and finishing it off whilst we're looking at the next one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much for spending this evening with me, Simon. Well, I think we spent far too many. It's been a pleasure. Far too many meetings on Zoom. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I mean, hopefully, you know, again, we, we, we've basically just discussed these pre existing tips and hopefully we translated them um, to people to sort of understand them perhaps a bit better. And um, yeah, maybe just and brought a few other tips to the table. But thank you very much. Um, And yeah, brilliant. Just like to say a massive thank you to Simon Moore for joining me, um, giving up his evening. Uh, Just to let you know, tomorrow I'm recording another podcast. That'll be out in the next few days. And we're going to be joined by none other than Dr. Simon Curtis, where we'll be talking about the written and the oral elements of the Diploma of the Westworld Company of Farriers exam. See you then.